But actually, this is the real process of knowledge. If one accepts this process, then the possibility of approaching the absolute truth exists. This is not the interaction of the temporal elements as described before. This is actually means to get out of it. So the activities we perform in the body, when performed by the direction of the spiritual master, under the, under the guidance of the spiritual master, then they get you out of the field of activities. So activities within the field of activities that are not connected to devotional service simply enhance your attachment to the field of activities in the material life. But the way to get out of it is to engage in devotional service and at the same time cultivate these 29 years of knowledge, which lead one out of the field of the activities or into the transcendental realm, transcendental consciousness. So Prabhupada goes on, all the descriptions of the process of knowledge, the most important is, is described in the first line of the tenth verse. The process of knowledge terminates in unalloyed devotional service to the Lord. So if one does not approach or is not able to approach the transcendental service of the Lord, then the, all the other 19 items are of no particular value. But if one takes the devotional service in full Krishna consciousness, the other 19 items automatically develop within him. The principle of accepting a spiritual master, as mentioned in the seventh verse, is essential. Even for one who takes the devotional service, it is most important. Transcendental life begins, begins when one accepts a bona fide spiritual master. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, clearly states here that this process of knowledge is the actual path. So try to understand. These items of knowledge which we just listed, listed is the actual process of knowledge. And when performed in relationship to devotional service, frees one from the material, uh, material activities, material desires. And Prabhupada goes on to say, anything speculated beyond this is nonsense. So we have discussed some of the items in the previous classes. We talked about humility, nonviolence, pridelessness, tolerance, simplicity, approaching a spiritual master, cleanliness. Now we are on steadiness. So for those of you who have not been here, this is a very important part of devotional service. Because just to remain within the activities of material life and at the same time perform devotional service is, doesn't really bring one to the platform of Krishna consciousness. One has to get out of the activities of material life by performing these activities for the service of the Lord. And therefore, these 20 items are foundational to cultivate the consciousness and perform the activities that bring about the uh, bring about the success of each and every one of these items. And humility allows one to absorb knowledge. Nonviolence means to preach or to relieve people of suffering. Tolerance means to practice uh, tolerating difficulties such as insult and dishonor. Simplicity means to be straightforward in all, all situations. Approaching a spiritual master is essential for understanding the process of devotional service because the spiritual master is the representative of Krishna whose only service to Krishna is to bring others to Krishna by guiding them according to Guru, Shada, Sadhu, and Shastra. In other words, he guides them according to the teachings of Shastra his own pure devotion and how that teachings has been practiced by the great souls in the past. That's the only service of the spiritual master. He has no other service. His only service is to bring others to Krishna consciousness. So accepting Krishna in the form of the spiritual master brings one to Krishna. Therefore, we say the spiritual master is a representative of Krishna and should be worshipped and honored in the same way that Krishna is.
in order to develop our consciousness of Krishna by accepting his visible form in the form of his pure devotee, uh, spiritual master. So that is essential. Approaching means to get guidance and to inquire into the nature of spiritual life. Like that. Okay, so we went over this, so I'm giving you a little summary. But at the end, we'll ask for questions, and you may ask questions on anything that was discussed in the past. Also. Cleanliness, external cleanliness, take a bath, keep your clothes clean, like that. Um, perform proper hygiene, remain healthy. Um, internal cleanliness means to chant. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Chaito, Dharma, Marjano. The heart and mind become cleansed by the process of chanting the holy name, which frees one from the dirt of material attachment, the dirt of material contamination due to previous material activities. So the next one is steadiness. Steadiness means that one should be very determined to make progress in spiritual life. So what is the word that's here? Determination. Without such determination, one cannot make tangible progress. So sometimes people ask, or sometimes people hear, this process of spiritual life is very easy. And sometimes they hear this process of spiritual life is very difficult. The same person will say this to the others. So what is it? Is it easy or is it difficult? It's both. But what makes it easy and what makes it difficult is determination. So without determination, it's difficult. With determination, it's easy. <laughs> so there's the definitions as they apply. So one has to become determined. So steadiness is a feature of determination in the practice of Krishna consciousness. How to remain steady. In this world, if you keep doing something the same way every day, the same time, people think you're a robot or it's boring. Right. In this world, change makes life exciting. Because material life doesn't really have any real enjoyment to it. So what makes it enjoyable? Change. change. Keep changing and that way you can find happiness in the change in something new, something new. Right? And people are always changing. In fact, in this age of Kali, we find in the present time so much change. And like, I travel a lot and I see people traveling everywhere. Young people, old people, in between. Everybody's traveling from place to place. Always looking for a different environment to do whatever they have to do. Change. Right? Change, change, change. Get a new car, get a new computer, get a new friend, get a new wife or husband, get a new home. Something different, something new, change, change, change. But devotees know that finding the process of devotional service and remaining steady in that, one actually develops the consciousness of determination and at the same time finds happiness in the same activities. By chanting every day, you chant more. By hearing every day, you want to hear more. By reading, we want to read more. By associating, we find happiness and we are eager for more association. So the more you do the same thing in the right consciousness, the better it gets. Although the activity is the same, the consciousness is changing, and not the activity. The consciousness is growing towards Krishna through constant practice of the same activity. So for a materialist, that's boring. But for spiritualists, that's happiness. Because we enjoy the activities more and more when we focus by perfecting that same activity in a very regular way, day after day after day after day. At 
after year, after year, after a decade, after millennium, a century. <laughs> so it's not that we're looking for change, we're just looking to go deeper into the activities we perform, seeing it's not about change. And self-control means that one should not accept anything which is detrimental to the path of spiritual. So Prabhupada goes on to something else. Okay. So the idea of steadiness. To be steady on something. Before you can become steady on something, you have to know why you're performing what you're doing. Sometimes, you know, people do things because their, their father did it, or their ancestors did it, or everybody else is doing it. But that doesn't really inspire people to put their heart into what they're doing. When you know why you're doing what you're doing, and what is the result of that, then you can become more steady and determined in practicing the same thing like that. So what are we doing? We're trying to serve Krishna. We're trying to please Krishna. We're trying to develop our love for Krishna. We're trying to develop knowledge of Krishna. We're trying to connect with Krishna in different ways. So that steadiness, in a determined way, brings about that consciousness. And therefore, we don't mind doing the same thing every day, because we know the results are you know, worth going for. What is those results? Taktwa Dehom Porna Janmani, 19 Mamiti Sarjuna. That by performing devotional service, in a steady way, one develops attachment from the Krishna, from that attachment, love develops, when love develops, one actually returns to Krishna in the spiritual world. So it's not a matter of just being routine or mechanical. It's done in the consciousness of pleasing Krishna and developing a relationship with Krishna through pleasing Krishna and satisfying Krishna by an emotional service. So steadiness. But the next one is self-control. Self-control means that one should not accept anything which is detrimental to the path of spiritual progress. Interesting definition, right? It doesn't say self-control means that somehow or other we should... Self-control can be understood in different ways. So that definition is quite surprising. In that self-control means accepting things favorable for my spiritual advancement and rejecting things unfavorable. So then the question comes, what is favorable and what is unfavorable? Well, the Shastras, the scriptures are full of what is called uh, vidis and nishedas. Nishedas means things you should not do and vidis means things you should do. So nobody likes to be told what not to do. Right? Or even like those who like to be told what to do. There's a class of people that spiritual life means just do your own thing and somehow want to worship God in, in the way that you want to worship God. But that means that you're listening to your mind and mind becomes the God and not God. So the mind becomes the director and we're worshiping our mind and not really the Lord. So the Lord gives us the path and He says the path is given by the Acharyas. Mahajano yena katastha pandita. Pandita means path. The path of spiritual life is taught by those who have traversed the path, who know the path, who can teach the path, and who explain the path in a way that people can practically perform that activity. So therefore, one has to accept the guidance of others, or the spiritual teachers, the Shastras, and follow the rules and regulations. Oh, rules and regulations. Oh, my God, what a bad word. Hmm. I don't, you know, I don't want, I just don't like rules and regulations. I want to be free. But nobody's free because everyone's under the influence of the material energy. So rules and regulations get you out. That's why Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Two sixty four in Gita. Who's the shadow? Who's the uh, I got the Gita here. Yeah, two sixty four. Raja Dwesa Vimukta is two. Indriyas Indriya 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Raja Dwaisa, be muktaised to. Raja Dwaisa, be muktaised to. Visaya Indriya Shchana, Atma Visaya Vehinaama, Prasadam Anigai Shuti. One who can control his senses by practicing the relative principles of freedom. So Krishna says, break the principles leading to freedom. Can obtain the complete mercy of the Lord and thus be free from all material attachment and all material aversion. So it's explained that one may externally control the sense of some artificial process. But unless one is engaged in devotional service following the principles of freedom, that is accepting what is favorable and rejecting what is favorable, then one will fail on the path of devotional service. So one has to know what is favorable and what is unfavorable. So therefore we inquire, is this favorable to my spiritual life? Is this unfavorable? Or how do I understand this activity in relationship to my, you know, activities in devotional service? So one should ask questions like that and accept only those things that are favorable. We do that in life anyway, don't we? We always look for things that are favorable for our success in life, for our happiness in life. And we very carefully avoid or reject things that are unfavorable. So we do that in life also. So you might not say that one, that's like the unwritten rules of the, of the material world. And sometimes we write it according to our own understanding. But still, we're following a set of principles. So in the same way, rules and regulations are not meant for restrictions, but for freedom. That's why Krishna calls them the uh, items of knowledge or the path of freedom. The regulative principles of freedom to do what you want to do is bondage. <laughs> so we were just like I remember I was driving on one highway in America and I saw one car was driving in and out of traffic real fast. And uh, then I just got off. I noticed this license plate because people put their own descriptions on the back of their license plate. And it was kind of funny, but at the same time reflective of his driving attitude and said, I'm free. Free to crash, <laughs> free to get a ticket, <laughs> free to cause other people distress by your so-called idea of freedom. So freedom does not mean to act according to the limbs and activities of the mind, but freedom means to follow rules and regulations. So therefore, there's a very strong set in the Nectar Devotion, there are 64 regulative principles. We want you to carefully understand and practice. And that gets us out of the material energy. So controlling our senses means to learn those rules and regulations and accept the favorable ones and avoid the ones that are Or accept them. And avoid the prohibitions and accept the principles of activity. Like that. Prabhupada goes on, one should become accustomed to this and reject anything which is on the path of spiritual progress. Just like, okay, this is, this, is, this is the difference between someone who is serious and someone who is not serious. Someone who is not serious will do what they want and then still perform devotional service and think they can get a benefit. Someone who is serious will say, is this good for my spiritual life? Is it not good? Should I eat more? Is it good? Should I eat less? Is it good? Should I sleep more? Is it good? I sleep less? Should I do this? In other words, they're always thinking what's beneficial for my spiritual progress? What's beneficial for my, for my developing the attention that I need and the focus in my devotional service? They think like that. They're always thinking what's good for Krishna and what's good for my spiritual progress. Not, well, I like to do this, I may suffer, but that's okay, this is fun. And then later on I'll just get back up and chant Hare Krishna again. No, they don't want to fall down or waste time or divert their attention away by performing something that's detrimental. So they're very careful 
to follow the, those things that are. Prabhupada says the senses are so strong that one is always anxious to have some sense gratification. One should not cater to these demands which are not necessary. The senses should only be gratified to keep the body fit so that one can discharge his duty in advancing spiritual life. The most important and uncontrollable sense is the tongue. Sarira vincha cha kutendriya taheka Jeeve fele visaya sagara jiva jive The tongue is the most difficult and voracious to control. There's only two ways you can control the tongue. Take only prasadam offered to the Lord. Speak only about devotional activities, about the glories and activities of the Lord. Then the tongue becomes controlled. One can speak all day and all night and be considered to be a sense controller if their talk is directed towards the benefit of others or devotional activities. It's not like the artificial yogis who think, oh, the tongue is most voracious, therefore we should not speak. So they think of Ram Khomoni Baba. They have a sign that says, give me two chapatis. They don't speak it, they just flash or something. So what are they doing? They're not, they're actually speaking through writing. But Prabhupada said, we can talk about Krishna all day and all night. We can accept Krishna Prashadam in the spirit of service to the Lord. So that controls the tongue. Otherwise, the tongue will do anything and anything. And the tongue will lead you to help. And sometimes we say something we don't really mean, and we're sorry we said it afterwards, but it's too late. So sense control doesn't mean to stop the senses, but to engage the senses in positive spiritual activity. Then the mind and senses are controlled. That's controlled. Therefore it says, there's a Chinese saying, it's Chinese, but it has a very, what we say, value. To speak when you should be silent, and to be silent when you should speak is both a witness, a weakness. When you're, when you're meant to speak and you remain silent, that is a weakness. And when you're meant to remain silent and you speak, that is a weakness also. So one should discriminate between what is beneficial and what is not. And one should speak, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, the austerities of the tongue is to speak truthfully, beneficially, Avoid speech that offends others. Hallelujah. We should never cause distress or anxiety to anyone for any reason by our speech. Avoid speech that offends others and quote the Shastras regularly. These are the austerities of speech. If we practice that, the mind and senses are in control and we can speak. And that is considered the best form of sense control. Not simply remaining quiet. We remain quiet if we have nothing to say. But then again, if there's something that should be said, if there's some question that should be asked, or you can speak beneficially to help someone, then it's your duty to do that. As it becomes a duty to act new speech for the benefits of others. Okay. okay. And Prabhupada goes on, he wants to really make this point. The most, you know, the function of the tongue is to taste and to vibrate. And he then goes on to explain what I just did. As far as the eyes are concerned, they should, be, should not be allowed to see anything but the beautiful form of Krishna. How do we live that way? Therefore, we should somehow, every morning, in the beginning of the day, as the day begins, 
take darshan of the beautiful form of Krishna. Whether you're at home, then take darshan of home deities. Or if you don't have deities, see the beautiful picture of Krishna. There's so many pictures that are available. Or come to the temple and take the darshan of the deity. And keep that form within the mind throughout the day. You can look into this world and see the different forms and at the same time not see them. That's called spiritual vision. But then there's those who are always looking to satisfy the eye's desire to see something beautiful by looking this way and that way and this way and that way and this way. And therefore their minds are never happy or satisfied. But when we see the beautiful form of Krishna, and Krishna's beautiful, yes? Out of all his qualities, the most, what we say, attractive to his devotee, the Lord is his beauty. He has so many transcendental qualities, but we remember him mostly for his beauty. He's so beautiful that he attracts himself. Don't try it. <laughs> we do that sometimes, we look at the mirror and think, I'm getting better. <laughs> but Krishna, he, he's, he was walking one day and he passed this pillar which had a reflecting uh, surface on it. And then he passed it he said, Wow, who was that? And he went back to look at it again and he realized it was himself. <laughs> he got so attracted he didn't even realize he was looking at himself. So in that way, the, the eyes become purified by seeing the transcendental vision. And if we, if we, for some reason, we can't see externally so much, we keep that beautiful vision in the mind. And that vision in the mind is just as good as Krishna's external form of transcendental beauty. If we can meditate on that form within the mind. And then the eyes become satisfied. The beauty of this world is ephemeral. Ephemeral means it appears to be something wonderful, but it's not as, it's, it's, it's more, it's more talk about it than it actually is. So, but Krishna's beauty is transcendental, and therefore his beauty is always increasing. Where the beauty in this world is always coming and going. Sometimes it's nice and sometimes it's not. So, therefore, one can only satisfy the desire of the eyes to see something beautiful, and to see the beautiful form of Lord Krishna, especially Krishna and Sri Vrindavan Dham, which is the epitome of all the beautiful forms of the Lord. And all the forms of the Lord are beautiful. Lord Chaitanya is called Gauranga. Right? It's called Gaur Sundar. Sundar means beautiful. One who has a golden complexion that is so beautiful. His devotees, his devotees would see Lord Chaitanya, they couldn't take their eyes off. They were mesmerized by his qualities, his speech, his presence, but his beauty captivated him so much that when they weren't seeing that beauty, they were thinking, our eyes have been cheated. We're having to look at something else. The gopis, what are the gopis? Ah, the gopis? They cursed Lord Brahma. Brahma, you're the creator of this body, and you made eyes with eyelids. And when those eyelids blink, we lose you know, focus on Krishna. Therefore, although you're the creator, you're full of faults. <laughs> they're serious. They're not just saying that they're making sounds like They're thinking to blink your eyes means to interrupt your darshan of Krishna. And sometimes you blink your eyes and you don't even know it. <laughs> but the gopis, when they blink their eyes, they feel somehow we lost Krishna for that flash of a blink. That's how much they're absorbed in the beautiful form of Krishna. So we get an indication of how beautiful Krishna is by his pure devotees and how much they're eager to see that transcendental form. And Krishna has so many transcendental forms that he wants to satisfy all his devotees in whatever mood they are. So he appears always in a very beautiful way. And when you dress Krishna, he gets more beautiful. Krishna is already beautiful. 
But when the, when the clothes are applied to Krishna, the clothes become more beautiful and Krishna also becomes more beautiful. Although the clothes don't make Krishna beautiful, but when they're on Krishna, they become beautiful and they appear to make Krishna more beautiful. That's why we decorate the deity so nicely, to enhance the quality of his beauty. But where does his beauty really expand itself? By our devotion. Because when we have that devotional mood, Krishna reveals himself more. And then his beauty becomes even more available to our eyes through our devotion. Premanjaritam bhakti velochanena. Santasa daivara deyasa vilokinanti yam shyama sundar achinta guna sarupa govindam ali purusha tamahamajami. When the eyes are decorated with love, when the eyes are decorated with love, when love decorates the eyes, the eyes can actually see. And the, 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 the word is uh, kajal. Kajal is a mascara that people use to enhance the beauties of the young ladies, put that black on. And it looks really nice. You know, the eyes look really kind of like really far out. But when you put the, put the cudgel of love on the eyes, then the eyes actually become beautified, and then one can see the beautiful form of Krishna more form. So love is the ointment that decorates the eyes and reveals Krishna's beauty in the world. So it's easy to love Krishna. Why? Because Krishna is lovable. In this world, you have to force yourself to love somebody. I mean, okay, you like him. It's all right. He's, he's not so bad. She's not so bad. But then again, it's not always like that. <laughs> so there's some kind of forced you know, austerity in trying to love someone in this world. But Krishna is just naturally attractive. All you have to do is want to be attracted by Krishna. It's natural to be attracted by Krishna. And that naturalness comes as we purify our heart and develop that loving relationship. And then we want to see Krishna more. And then you're actually seeing Krishna. When a pure devotee looks at Krishna, and when we look at Krishna, we see two different Krishnas. We see two different Krishnas. We're seeing so much, but he's seeing much more. Not only is he seeing more, but he's actually you know, talking to Krishna in that loving relationship. So that's, that's Krishna, he's all attractive. So the eyes should be allowed only to see the beautiful form. The ears should be engaged in hearing about Krishna, the nose and smelling the flowers and the incense offered to the Lord. This is the process of devotional service. All the senses can be engaged in the service of the Lord. None of the senses are stopped artificially as the Maya bodies in the personal state that sense objects are the cause of fall down, therefore they stop all sensual activity. But you can't stop sensual activity. Even when you sleep, the senses are working on the subtle level to cause the dream state. So even in the mind, you're seeing dreams, which is another form of visual sense objects. But when you engage those same senses, for the service of the Lord, then the senses become accentuated and one is purifying the senses. So that's the process. So controlling the mind and senses means to accept what is favorable for devotional service. False ego means accepting this body as oneself. E real ego means I am Krishna's part and parcel. I have an eternal loving relationship with Krishna. I am the same quality as Krishna. Krishna is spirit, I am spirit. Krishna is great spirit, I am small spirit. We are of the same quality, therefore we have an eternal relationship. That's called real identity. Everyone has an identity. Now, it's not that we all have a somewhat neutral identity. We're all spirit souls, we all love Krishna, and we're all part and parcel of Krishna. That's the general definition, but in that generality, there's specifics. That each and every living entity 
has a unique, loving relationship with Krishna that's different than any other loving Just like in this world, you don't find two people the same. There's no two fingerprints to sing. There's no two voice tones to sing. Although voices are very similar. Sometimes people can imitate another person's voice. But even that, there's, a, there's always something, something less than the actual imitation. So in this world, you know, even exact twins, you know, sometimes you see exact twins, you can't tell them apart. But there's some difference there. I'll go a little deeper into the investigation. But in the spiritual, so in this world, everyone is unique material. But in the spiritual realm, every spirit is unique spiritual. That's why Krishna is eager to taste loving relationships with each and every living entity. Because each and every living entity has a slightly or even greatly different relationship with him in love than others. And Krishna is the most lusty boy in the world. And he's the, he is considered the king of lust. He wants to enjoy each and every person in a loving relationship. He's not satisfied just with some few billion living entities. <laughs> he wants to enjoy each and every one. So he's always eager for someone to develop that love with him because each one has a certain flavor. And that flavor is called ras. And within the ras, there's finer elements of that ras that makes that ras even sweeter. So variety, happiness means variety. So within loving relationships, the more variety there that come with the love, the more happiness one experiences in that loving relationship. We see that in this world, people want to enjoy different people. They want something different, just to taste the sweetness of that kind of relationship. That's there in Krishna also. Otherwise, how is it here in the material world? So each and every one of us has a unique, wonderful, and loving relationship with Krishna that's different than each and than everyone else. So real ego is to try to come back to that identity and give up the false identity. When the false identity is, what Krishna speaking here, the field of activities, the material body. The material body is simply given to you by material nature through your mother and father. You're awarded a body so you can perform your activities in this world. And your, your activities in this world are of two natures. One that make you more attached to this world, or one that gets you out of the attachments of this world. We have a choice which direction our activities are performed. Therefore, to have a material, human material body is considered a great boon because it's a chance to get rid of all bodies. In other words, we, to accept a human form, that means now I can stop having bodies. I can stop having bodies and I can come to my spiritual body. As we have a material body, different ones, life after life, with different families. Just like, you know, now people are imitating the Americans, right? American rock and roll, American jargon, right? American ways of doing things. So then, next life you take birth of a man. So you can don't, you don't have to imitate, you're just part of it, you're seeing that. So whatever you like focus on in this life, you're developing a consciousness that is projecting you towards that type of activity in your next life. And then when you die, you will take birth accordingly. Karma died in a tree. Under the influence of material energy, you get a body according to your desires and activities of this life. But the idea is to stop taking material bodies. So anything that is connected with the body is not me. Or the mind. And when we say body, we mean body and mind. So these are superfluous to the living entity's existence. We simply live within the body. The body is dear because we're in it. That's all. This 
it's like you take care of your car because you need it to drive. You live in your house, you keep it clean, you protect it because it's your house. It's a place where you dwell. So we dwell within this body and we keep the body functioning nicely. And not so we can enjoy the body, but so we can have the opportunity to perform devotional service in such a way that we can maximize the results of the devotional service by taking care of this body very nicely. That's all. And the body is not yours anyway. As Krishna says, this body belongs to me because it's made out of material energy. It's made out of material energy, and the material energy is one of Krishna's energy. So if you analyze the ingredients of this body, it's simply the ingredients that make up the material energy. And so when we are living within this material body, we should understand that it's simply a vehicle. That's all. It's a vehicle. It's not me. I take care of it. Who am I? I am the soul within the body. So false ego means to identify with any aspect of the material. So this verse goes on and on and on. There's more items of knowledge. Uh, one should understand uh, the evils of birth, death, disease, and old age. People think, you know, if I don't make money, that's not good. If I don't find a nice wife or husband, that's not good. If, I, if my kids are not behaving well, that's not good. So they consider these are the horrors of material life. If I can't get a job, that's not good. But here it says that the real suffering is birth, death, disease, and old age. Because that brings about material existence, which causes all the other problems to follow. So one should cultivate the knowledge of birth. I mean, what is birth? I mean, we celebrate happy birthday. Right? Happy birthday. But when you came out, you were not dancing. You were crying. And your mother had to go through so much pain. I mean, you ladies know it. Us guys don't know it. We just hear about it. And the ladies, the pain of childbirth is so great that even the women who curse their husbands during labor, right? Never again, never again. But then, of course, after it's all over, they forget. Yeah, Prabhupada was talking to one of his disciples who worked on an ambulance. He was saying when we would pick up the ladies and take them to the hospital in their, their final arrows in labor, they would be cursing their husbands. The pain is so great. But and we consider, oh, you know, once all over, uh, the child is there, everyone forgets, and we call it happy birthday. It wasn't happy for the mother when she was going through it. It wasn't happy for the child when he was coming out. Happy birthday. <laughs> it's happy now, after so many years. <laughs> And what was happening, it wasn't so nice. And it's explained in the Bhagavatam that when the child is in the womb of the mother, at the seventh month, if the child is a little bit pious, then Krishna does something very special. He uncovers the illusion for that baby in the womb, and the baby can see its last 100 verse. And then the baby realizes his relationship with God and prays in the womb and says, My dear Lord, I am your eternal servant, and I'm about to come into this world again. When I come out, I'll simply serve you for my whole life. <laughs> that happens. It's mentioned in the Bhagavatam. Krishna does something special to certain children, not all children, but those who are pious. He uncovers that and reminds them who they are. And then when they come out, they forget again. And everyone says, oh, boo boo, ga ga ha ha. <laughs> and the baby thinks, that's eh, not so bad out here. <laughs> and then the baby goes out and does whatever it wants to do. Like so it forgets those prayers in the womb. Birth means to forget. So birth. Old age, everybody knows old age, you get four eyes and three ears, you know, three, uh, four eyes and three legs, three legs is a cane, 
Your body doesn't work anymore. Hey, what you saying? Can you speak a little louder? I can't hear you. What are you deaf? No, I'm just old. That's all. <laughs> you can't, you know, nothing works anymore. You try to go to the bathroom and you think, you know, you stay there for a half hour and nothing comes out. <laughs> It's really, I'm just warning you of the future. You know, just, <laughs> so, yeah, it's miserable. It's just miserable. It's not so nice. And everyone who's old is thinking, oh, I wish I was young. Yeah. These are the materials. Of course, for devotees, as they get older, they get wiser, and then they get more Krishna conscious. So that's the, but old age is that as a feature of this material existence is very painful and miserable. And now in this society, when you get old, people don't even want to talk to you, look at you. Ooh, just got all these wrinkles, you know. They don't like old people. When they put them into old age homes, they neglect them. And the old people suffer. In one culture, when people get old, they kill the grandfather. It's in certain African cultures. So he doesn't have to suffer too much when he gets a certain age, uh, they, they kill him. And he brought him. Isn't that nice? <laughs> yeah, you know how they do it? They put him on the top of the roof and they roll him off the roof and he falls. And they just keep doing it until he dies. Yeah, Bhagavad mentions this in the Bhagavad <laughs> Then they take him and they have they have grandfather Prashad. Prashad Bhagavan Prashad. Yeah. 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 Number one business in the world is the drug business. The pharmaceutical business makes trillions of dollars selling drugs to people with disease. Doctors, pharmacists, it's a huge you know, mega business. You, know, because every, you can guarantee somebody's going to get sick. <laughs> and there's so much you know, people make. Doctors have exorbitant prices, you get sick, you gotta get health insurance, then you wind up, you realize the health insurance didn't cover that the type of sickness you have. You go to the hospital, you pay $2,000 a day for a room. It's, <coughs> disease is just so, so much a feature. Now we see even young people, because of the age we live in, and because the way people live, they get, they, People die young, people get diseases young. Because of the way away. So disease, old age, and then of course everybody knows death is miserable. Nobody wants to die. Even if you're suffering, you think, I still want to live. So these are the so therefore Prabhupada explains that one should try to understand the miseries of these four things. This is misery. And by engaging the devotional service, we can free ourselves from birth, death, and old age. And disease, if it comes, we're not so much bothered by it. It's opportunities to go deeper into our Krishna consciousness. Now this is the real suffering in this world. And of course, there's many more items of knowledge, but I don't want to spend so much time because we have to see if there's any questions. Any questions on the ones we went over? The miseries of birth, death, disease, and old age, steadiness, um, false ego, control of the senses, or any of the other items that we, we, we discussed earlier. Uh, Maharaj, when you were mentioning this control of senses, you were mentioning the tongue is most uh, dangerous and difficult. difficult. And then you, you were mentioning that. Uh, uh, we should, under no circumstances, like offend somebody or say something which will be not pleasing yeah. to people. So that's called the austerity of speech. So how how is that possible? I mean, practically, in the it's possible. 
It's possible by Krishna consciousness. When you see the good in everyone and try and, and overlook whatever faults they have, we have to practice that. Try to see the good in everybody. Even in the Nandavodis, there's some good things we can see. What's the good thing about the Nandavodis is that Krishna is in their heart. So you can actually offend Nandavodis also by offending Krishna within the heart of the Nandavodis. So therefore, one, a devotee who is actually fixed in Krishna consciousness doesn't cause distress to anyone. They're always in a mood of serving others, and therefore they're always beneficial to others. The mood of service is the mood of uh, the mood of service is the mood of assisting others in whatever way you can help them. And if there's some fault, overlook it. That's all. As you want people to overlook your faults, you should also learn to look, overlook the faults of others. It says, there's four ways to see a person. You can see their faults, and you can see their good qualities. Focus on the good qualities. You can see their faults as potential good qualities. You can see their, what's the other one? Their faults as potential good qualities, and you can ultimately see that they have no faults, even though they do. That's, that's purified vision. Or a Mahabharata devotee, because we're not Mahabharatas, he doesn't see any faults in anyone. He sees everyone as better than him, even the non devotees. But that's, that's the highest vision. So even if there's some fault, it's not so important. Just let me look at Yes. Does that help? I mean, if you're, if you're dealing with your children, you have to find faults in them to correct them. So they progress. But you're not finding faults in helping them. You're doing them good by correcting them, by, ch by chastising them for doing the wrong thing. That's your service. That's a service to them. That's not a fault. The spiritual master will do that with his disciples just to instruct them, to teach them, to help them. Not that because he wants to find faults so he can just, you know, enjoy finding faults. He does it as a service. But in general, if we don't have a position of taking care of others, then we should not find fault with those outside of our care. And the non-devotees are full of faults. But we understand the non-devotees, and therefore we don't go around finding fault with them because we know them from the faults. So, but they, we were once like them, so we were also like them. So now we think, why can we help them become Krishna consciousness? So finding fault is just wasting time. Which, it just disturbs the mind. Yes? Uh, I would like to ask something about uh, violence. Uh, if you can, if you can maybe say uh, which which actions uh, go goes in this category. And uh, as Sajinan Swami said once uh, that uh, when devotees are chanting uh, holy name, that he pays uh, whatever he is doing, he pays attention to this uh, devotee. Uh, and uh, I'm interested to know uh, how does Krishna feel uh, when there is violence uh, going on amongst devotees? Mm -hmm. He leaves. He doesn't like it. What? He leaves. He leaves. Yeah. 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 He's not there. <laughs> because amongst devotees, devotees are men. Sadhu Sangha to, to serve each other, to make friends with each other, to assist each other. And if you have problems with another devotee, best not to associate with it, to avoid any problems. And if you can't avoid association, always be respectful, at least. But a devotee is kind. That's the first principle out of the 26 qualities of devotee. It's kind. 
He's not out to you know, cause difficulty to anyone. He was the ground of all this. Everybody's calm. So when there's enmity or envy or even violence, it's, it's in the lower modes of material energy. It's based on false ego, and it just it doesn't solve the problem. It makes it more sense. Krishna goes away. He's not happy with the situation. It's like if we're chanting with offense, he's not there. If we're chanting without offense, he comes. So if we're committing offenses like violence, he leaves. He's not present. He's not going to be there when we're not, we don't cooperate. And cooperation is very difficult when we use the problem. But we should practice that. Co-operate. We need to operate together. And that's why when Prabhupada left, he was asked, ah, you know, what can we do once you're gone? How can we serve you? He said, cooperate. Cooperate to bring, you, to bring this institution to others. Cooperation. If we could cooperate as a society worldwide, then the whole world would be Krishna consciousness in the past. That's what's stopping it. Our lack of ability to cooperate. So how do you cooperate? I have my opinion, you have your opinion. But well, let's take Prabhupada's opinion. So therefore we have to carefully study Prabhupada's instructions and guidance and apply those principles in our life in order to bring about cooperation. That's, that's one way. The other way is to learn how to sacrifice your own opinion for the, just for the sake of cooperation. Example, I want to do something and you want to do something. You both want to do the same thing. You want to do it this way, I want to do it that way. My way is 80% good, yours is 90% good. It doesn't matter, it doesn't care which one you accept, just accept one of them and cooperate. It's not about perfection, it's about cooperation. When we cooperate, Krishna's there to make things wonderful. There's a, there's a famous story. It's called the archetype. Do you like to hear the story? It's a little long, but it's really instructive. There was one monastery somewhere in Europe and it was a very flourishing Christian monastery. And so, um, many people were coming, and there was many brothers in the monastery. It was very successful. After some time, things changed. People stopped coming, many of the brothers left, things went down. And after some time, there was only six brothers left in the monastery, and hardly anyone was coming. So there was some concern about those who were left. One day, one of the brothers heard that a rabbi, a very respectable rabbi, was traveling in the area. So he came and said to the abbot of the monastery, please go and meet that rabbi and ask him what we can do to again become successful in our spiritual life. So the abbot thought, all right, it's an opportunity to meet this very holy man from the Jewish tradition. So he went. So they met, very friendly, they were talking. The rabbi said, I see you have some question you want to ask me. He said, yes, we are concerned. He described the previous situation and the present situation. He said, what can we do to bring it back? The rabbi thought for a minute, and then finally said, I don't know really what to tell you, but I can tell you one thing for sure. One of the brothers in the monastery is the next chosen person by God to be the Messiah. He is a very elevated person. And the rabbi said, which one? He said, I don't know. But I know one of them had six from there. So, the abbot 
after some time, they, they pardoned me their ways, the other went back. And then they all came around and asked, what did the rabbi say? I said, well, he said that one of you, he didn't have an answer, he said, but one of you is the Messiah. So they thought, and they started looking at each other. And then they started to think, well, maybe it's John, although he's, you know, he sleeps a lot, but he works hard. Well, maybe it's Brother Paul, uh, he's always complaining, but he's right. <laughs> so they were kind of like wondering who it was, but nobody knew who it was. So in order not to commit, commit offenses to any of each of them, they started to serve each other in the question, not knowing which one was the advocate of the Messiah. And that went on, and after some time, the more people joined, and people started coming. So as soon as there's cooperation and love between the devotees, Krishna starts to show his mercy in so many ways. When that's not there, all we do is struggle. That's all. We think it's just go down. So this cooperation is such a high principle that if we see each devotee as Prabhu, Prabhu means master. We use the word Prabhu. It means that I'm here to serve you, not that you're here to serve me. If each of us thinks I'm here to serve you, and everyone becomes the servant of each other, and that way we can serve the Lord by serving each other. And that's Krishna consciousness. Of course, there's a way of serving. There's a way of serving. But still, the way of service is what's pleasing to Krishna. The mood of friendship, the mood of love. Not the mood of fault finding, not the mood of politicking. Politics has nothing to do with spiritual life. Politics is politics. Politics means to position yourself according to my opinion and push that opinion forward as the way of things. Krishna doesn't care about your opinion. He wants to see cooperation. Okay, is that how? Almost. <laughs> what else should we say? Nothing for now. Okay. I will just think a little bit. Yeah, try to see the good qualities of others. Yes. Uh, what, what, what is uh, with false ego? Is possible in material world to have a really ego? Is, is it possible in the material world to, to not have ego? In the material world, no. In the spiritual world, yeah. Because false ego means to identify with something you're not. If you think you're a woman, that's false ego. If you think I'm a man, that's false ego. You're not. You're in a woman's body, but you're not a woman. You're, not, you're in a, a Croatian body, but you're not Croatian. You're in a young body, but you're not young. So the body we have has so many characteristics and qualities. But if you think that's me, that's possible. Thank you. 
So now you're a man. So which one is real? The woman's body or the man's body? Or maybe the one before that? We told the story of Chichuketu this morning to illustrate this point. Chichuketu's son died, and then the sages brought him back to life because Chichuketu was lamenting. And his son said, he said, come back and meet your father. He said, what do you mean father? Which father? Which father? Who's my father? Krishna's my only father. So as long as we still maintain the bodily concept of life, we will identify with that as me. Not me. You're on a stage. You're put into this body because you have material karma. So you have to see yourself different than your body. So who is yourself? That's you're the spirit in the body. Pure spirit. That's real evil. That's the only evil. But you must act like a woman, you must act like a man, you must act like you know, a guru. You must play your material role, but don't get attached to the role. It's only a role. That's right. It's like a dramatic performance. And after a while, death just changes everything. Then time to play a new role. <laughs> the curtain's over, the act is over, the next play. Yeah, you come out again. You got a different body, a different country, a different set of circumstances. So, and now that becomes you, right? <laughs> and then this you will become the other you. But neither one is you. You are Krishna part and parcel. You belong with Krishna. You are the same quality as Krishna. You are pure spirit. Your identity is love, knowledge, and eternal happiness. Through unaligned service to the Lord. In various ways. The spiritual world is full of variety. The material world is full of variety. But one variety leaves us Parts, you know, more verse and deaths, the other variety brings us quadratics. So, unless we remember that, then when we get into a situation of sickness, or even when we're about to die, we'll become distressed. We'll think, oh, it's terrible. No, it's not happening to you, it's happening to your body. Okay, I'm in my body. It seems like it's happening to me, but it's not. Because we're so connected with the body. It's like one preachers was preaching to two people, a man and a woman, and he was saying, You're a spirit soul. You're a spirit soul. She says, Yes, I know I'm a spirit soul. I'm a female spirit soul. He's a male spirit soul. So we put the genders onto the, onto the souls according to our particular bodily gender. And that's the, that what causes us suffering. The suffering is to identify with something that's not us. Even if you lose all your money, so what? <laughs> You're still there. You think, oh, in America, 1929, 1920, yeah, the 30s, People were losing all their money from the stock market crashes. They were jumping out of windows committing suicide. Without money, what is the use of life? But well, money, you know, it's useful, but you can live without it. And sometimes you live better without it. <laughs> it's useful. So any loss in this world, we can expect it. Whatever you've got, you're going to lose. But you never lose your identity and you never lose your relationship with Krishna. And that you will always have. So why not focus on that now and just tolerate these other identities? Isn't that good news? I think it's really good news. 
Everyone's afraid of death, but you don't die. Your body dies. You don't have a body, so you don't die. You don't. Isn't that nice? Well, we put so much importance on the body. And the body is useful. We should try to preserve it because it's useful for Krishna consciousness. It's natural to preserve the body. And Bhagichi was asked by the demigods to give up his body so they could make bones, a weapon out of his bones. He challenged the demigods and saying, the body is the most dearest thing and you're asking me to give it up. He knew that he would do it. But he was just speaking philosophy, just to enlighten the demigods who were asking him for his body so they could have a weapon to kill this big demon called Vitrasura. And Krishna sent them to Dadat Gavichi and said, he'll give you the body, just ask for it. But he didn't give it right away. He said, you're asking for, for my body, but don't you know the body is the most dear thing to a person? Don't you know what you're asking? <laughs> He wanted to test them just to see how much they understood. And he challenged them. And they, they, were, they weren't able to give satisfactory answers. But they had to agree with them. And then finally he gave up his body and they made a weapon out of his bones because he had performed austerities for thousands of years. And his bones were so powerful that they, they became the thunderbolt of Indra. Indra has that thunderbolt that was made from the Dichi's bone. So, yeah, you can lose your money, you can lose your everything, but if you lose your body, that's the greatest loss, right? But that you lose anyway, because that's good. Time takes that away, so that's not you either. Therefore, in, on the spiritual level, there's nothing to gain, there's nothing to lose. On the material level, we're always trying to gain something, and we're always afraid of losing something. But spiritually, there's nothing to gain, nothing to lose. All we have to do is just connect with Krishna. And then we gain our realization of our relationship with Krishna. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for that in the material way, in our activities in, in this world. We're trying to find that same happiness through material activities, but it's there with our relationship with Krishna. Therefore, it says when you're Krishna conscious, you fulfill all your desires eternally, perfectly. You have no one of that desire as well. You have reached perfection. So that's what we should focus on, what it means to detach ourselves from all these identities that keep us in this idea that I am his body. Mm -hmm. When you're young, it's tough. Right? Because you have big plans in this world. I'm going to get married. I'm going to find a nice husband or wife. I'm going to get this. I'm going to enjoy. Right? When you get old, you think, you know, what's going on? But in either case, the reality doesn't change. Even not the body. Okay, that's real ego. Real ego. Okay, so, should we stop here? Question? Did you, did you raise your hand? No. No, you didn't. Okay, I thought someone raised their hand. Yes, yes. Okay. I want to ask you, uh, he says that we should see and emphasize the good things in the person. Yeah, I'm trying to. And we like the bad things. It's overlooking. But also, uh, one should be truthful. And Prabhupada says that to be truthful means that, that to say what is what, even if it's not good to hear. If somebody is a thief, you should say you are a thief. Or something like that. So, uh, so that's different. <clears throat> if somebody is you know, breaking the law or committing some gross activities, that's harmful in themselves and others, you can speak up. But the idea of Satya Priya was Satya Guru. To speak the truth easily. It's to 
speak the truth in a pleasant way and not cause more distress or conflict in trying to help people. A person who's performing negative activities, when you try to instruct them, you just increase the negativity. Unless you know how to speak in such a way that you can reach them. I'll give you an example. I told this example this morning. There was one senior devotee who was being criticized really heavily. And I was very close to this person. So I went to the person who was criticizing him. And the person was wrong in criticism. So I challenged him. And in a very nice way, asked him to really explain why he felt like that. And so he got, became more excited and started to speak even more about heavy. I just sat there and listened to him. And I didn't argue with him. I didn't go against him. I listened until he was done. And then basically I said a few things in a very nice way. At the end, he appreciated that and said, thank you very much. He realized that he was wrong, and then he went to apologize to the senior devotee. Now, if I would have challenged him and made it an argument, which I couldn't get, in which the way I felt, it wouldn't have solved the problem. It wouldn't have dispersed. So when you're trying to change a person or instruct them for the better, you have to know how to do it. Otherwise, you make it worse. So just calling a thief a thief doesn't really make the situation better. If you can reform the thief or help them understand what they're doing is wrong, and then that's beneficial to everybody. Of course, if someone is doing a great offense, that should be should be shouldn't be hidden because we don't want to offend the offender. That's not the idea. But in the day-to-day -day activities, when we're dealing with people, if there's some, you know, somebody has a bad quality, you kind of like, you kind of like tolerate it and just focus on the positive. It helps. It doesn't always solve the situation, but it doesn't make it worse. for little things. We shouldn't tolerate if somebody's causing harm to someone else and we can make a difference to stop that person or protect that other person, we should say something. It's like, you know, we were having a Harunam on the Harunam tour one night and there was this guy he started to dance with us, but he kept going on the women's side. Who was, who was there? Why well, anyway, you were there? Remember that guy? And, uh, what was the what town was that? Was it? Pool. Pool. Yeah. And he kept coming, and then he started grabbing the ladies, pulling them to the dance with him. So I got really angry. And then he saw me, he said, I, I look like a shrink man. So, and he said, I, I, I'm just joking, I'm just joking, I'm just, just a joke, just a joke, just a joke, just a joke. So, you know, I had to do that in order to stop him because he was disturbing the ladies and he was committing offense to himself and others. So that, we could do that. But you have to learn how to act according to time, place, and circumstances. So he got the message fast. So, you know, okay. so sometimes you have to be tolerant, sometimes you have to know the situation, whether to speak or not speak, act or not act. Are they going to make it worse or make it make it better? I mean, I watched the guy for a while, and I didn't say anything at the beginning. I saw that he was starting to act a little more, but I let it go on. And then finally, when he started to actually start to grab the women by the hand and pull them, and then I said something. But I was watching him. So that's an example of how we should look at the situation. If someone is offending someone else, we may be able to speak up. Okay. But then again, don't 
offend the offender. <laughs> Try to speak in such a way as to somehow make the situation better. It, it take, it's not, you don't act or you do act. You should know when to act and when not to act. And therefore, it takes a little thought. You see what I'm saying? It's not one way or the other. You don't let nonsense go on in the name of tolerance. But at the same time, you may not be the person to change the situation. Sometimes you want to help, but you know if I help, I'll make it worse. But if this person helps, it might be more beneficial. A lot of times, when we see devotees having problems, we bring in a friend of both of them, and that way, that helps to ease the situation. If I try to come in, I might have the same influence as another person. So we're always thinking how to solve the situation in the best possible way. So it's not about acting, it's not about not acting. It's about acting and talking. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We did go over a little bit, didn't we? Okay. Anything else? Thank you. It's your phone call. Do you mind if I leave you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.